Hello, my name is Nathan Robinson. I am the editor of Current Affairs magazine, and I am the author of books like Trump Anatomy of a Monstrosity. And today I want to talk about the Democratic primary. Specifically, I want to talk about Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. I have long been personally a supporter of Senator Bernie Sanders, um, but I know many good, kind, decent, progressive people who are supporters of Elizabeth Warren. And there's sort of a, at the moment, the race has been very contentious, but there's been calls for unity to put aside the acrimony between Sanders supporters and Warren supporters and to focus on, you know, the real enemy, which is people like Joe Biden and uh, Pete Buttigieg, right? And so there are some progressive groups that are sitting out the conflict. Uh, there are a lot of people who say, "Well, we shouldn't. We shouldn't go too hard on Elizabeth Warren if we're Sanders supporters." And uh, I think, actually, that a lot of these calls for unity right now are kind of mistaken. Um, and the reason for that is that. At the moment, the progressive block of the Democratic Party, if you will, is kind of split between Sanders and Warren. Um, and that means that the progressive block collectively, if there were one candidate, would be doing much better. Each one of those would be doing much better, right? So one of the reasons that uh, we have kind of an advantage in this primary is because there are multiple centrist candidates. There's Joe Biden, there's Pete Buttigieg, there's Amy Klobuchar, there's Cory Booker. Um, but uh, the progressives have two candidates. They have Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. Bernie Sanders is kind of ahead right now. Elizabeth Warren was ahead earlier. Um, and so the, the question is, well, should we, what should we do here, right? Because someone, only one person can win the primary and ultimately all people who are sort of on the left want one of these two candidates to win. And, and many of them have fairly positive feelings about the other one. So what do we do? Do we, do? Do we uh, you know, and I think the answer is, well, early on right now, we have to kind of fight it out. We really have to make clear why we support our candidate, why we don't support the other candidate, and one of those two has to be the winner, and the other has to leave the race and throw their support behind uh, the one who is ahead. Um, so I think it's actually very important that we don't try and keep Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren in the race together for as long as possible. What we really need to do is get one of them out fast. And I think the one that has to be out personally is uh, Elizabeth Warren. Um, and that's not just because she is behind right now. Now she is behind, and I think if she loses the first couple of states, that will be a very clear indication that the dominant progressive choice is Bernie Sanders and that the people who support Elizabeth Warren really need to switch over, right? Because otherwise it could really damage the prospects of progressives in this race. Um, but beyond the fact that Bernie is ahead right now and Elizabeth Warren's campaign has been struggling uh, in raising money and in the polls, um, I think I want to go through why I think it's so important right now for left-leaning people of all kinds to support Bernie. Um, as I say, I know good people who, who support Warren and I kind of, instead of just trashing their <laughs> candidate, I want to invite them. I want to say, well, you know, I mean, and I want them to give their case to me for why they think uh, Warren is a superior candidate. But I think it's also important that we, as Sanders supporters, give our case for why we really, really very strongly think that Bernie Sanders is the only candidate who can beat Donald Trump, number one, and the only candidate with a vision for the kind of country that we want to live in and a plan for how to become that kind of country. And so I, instead of just like, you know, really just shitting all over Elizabeth Warren, um, I, I, I do, I want to be fairly positive and say, I think we need to have a conversation. We need to have a serious conversation about what the differences between these candidates are, right? Because 
we have to resolve this fast and we're not going to resolve it by doing kumbaya and pretending that there is no conflict. There is a conflict. These candidates are different. Uh, they having either one as the nominee would create differences in a race with Donald Trump and they would have very different presidencies. They've distinguished themselves from one another. So now is the time where you really need to look at the facts, look at the candidates. We need to argue it out and, you know, we'll make up afterwards. We'll have, you know, a moment where we, and, and we respect each other, but we need to make clear what the differences are. And so, and you need to get on the train of the candidate that is, that is the, the best candidate. Um, I, I've just written an article called Everyone's Getting on the Bernie Train because there's been a real upsurge in support for Bernie right now. And I think this is why I think it's so important to have this argument because um, there is a moment right now. The mainstream press have started taking Bernie Sanders a lot more seriously. There's even talk, oh, he could be the nominee. The Wall Street Journal published a thing that said, you know, get ready for President Sanders, right? And I think this is a really crucial moment where if we can unify the whole progressive left behind Bernie's candidacy, he can really crush these primaries. And if he crushes the primaries, if he really just you know, humiliates Joe Biden, who was the presumptive front runner, and Pete Buttigieg, who was the next big thing, um, then he is very well positioned. If he can wrap the nomination up quickly, he's very well positioned to start um, running against Donald Trump. And let's be clear, um, I'm talking to people who are on my side. So for us, Donald Trump is the real enemy. He's the monstrosity, right? So uh, what we really want to talk about is how we can move on to the process of eliminating Donald Trump. And I think what we should really look for in a candidate, right, is vision. We want someone who has a real clear uh, set of ideas, uh, a, a real clear sort of, um, they, they paint a picture of the kind of America that they want for the rest of us. Um, so they have policies that we endorse. They have, um, they have sort of, uh, you know, we can see what they are for. They have something that's really, really powerful and that sort of, I don't know what I say. Well, it kind of fills your soul, right? When you when you imagine what they're presenting. I think that's how Barack Obama won. That's kind of how Bill Clinton won. When Democratic candidates uh, win, it's because they really have a uh, an emotional appeal to people. So uh, you got to have a very powerful, very deep vision. Uh, you got to have a set of plans and policies that uh, we like, right? And are willing to fight for, uh, because ultimately uh, we need to be able to pitch the candidate. Um, so you need vision, then you need strategy. You need, first off, a plan for beating Donald Trump, and then you need a plan for actually implementing your vision as best as possible. And then third, I think you need character. Um, you need to have someone who people like. You need to have someone who has a lot of integrity, who has a very strong record of actually doing the things that they're promising to do. Because, I mean, we know about politicians, right, that at election time, all of them sound great, or some of them. But they'll tell you whatever you want to hear at election time. And the question really is, what are they like when they're not running, right? What do they, have they shown that they are a person who means the kind of thing that they say? Can you trust them? This is really, really important. They have to be a person of character because not only do you need to know that when they get into office, they're actually going to do the things that they've promised um, and are going to fight really, really hard for them, but you, know, you also need to be able to, uh, as supporters, pitch that candidate to other people, right? The job of supporters in a general election is to get people to vote for the candidate. So this is one reason that Hillary Clinton really struggled is because those of us, I mean, I supported Hillary Clinton during the general election, but I found it very, very difficult to make the case for her character because she is a person with a long history of uh, deceptive statements and of bad politics and of uh, just all around dishonesty and corruption, right? So um, it was very difficult, those of us who had to try and tell other people to vote for Hillary to do it and feel it, right? And if we can feel it, if we can really, you know, we really like this candidate that we're pushing and it isn't someone we have to like swallow our vomit and tell you, you know, uh, well, they're, they're a little better. It would be best if we weren't selling the lesser of two evils, but we were selling someone who wasn't evil. 
that would be great. So if the candidate has serious flaws in their character, things that are difficult to defend, things that Trump is going to clearly take advantage of and that are gonna be strong points for him and weak points for the candidate um, that really raise un make unnecessary problems and avoidable problems because of things in that person's character, um, then that's probably not the kind of nominee we want. So we need to look at, you know, what do they want? Uh, are they, do they have a plan? Uh, do they have sort of a, an organizing strategy, right? Uh, do they understand politics? And, uh, and are they the kind of person that we really think is uh, deserving of the office and, and also is the, the American people generally are gonna like. Um, and when you go through those things, I really do think that it becomes clear that first off, Elizabeth Warren would be a much weaker nominee against Donald Trump than Bernie Sanders. And second off, that uh, she wouldn't deliver the kind of presidency that those of us on the left are really looking to have. So if you take, if you take that, that vision thing, the number one thing, which is, you know, what kind of world are they, are they pitching to you? Well, you know, Bernie Sanders is a democratic socialist. And if you ask Bernie Sanders about his vision for the world, he says, you know, he starts talking about uh, healthcare. He starts talking about, you know, uh, people being able to go to college without go going into massive debt. He talks about the lives of working people. He talks about wages and how rent's too high. He talks about uh, war and ending America's endless foreign wars, which he's had a longstanding commitment to. Um, and Elizabeth Warren talks about some of this stuff too, but I think it's important to note that some of the ways in which Elizabeth Warren's vision works are not very inspiring, and I also don't think are going to change the country in the ways that we need. Um, you notice she talks a lot about anti-corruption, right? She talks a lot about how she's very pro-capitalist and pro-market, um, but there's too much corruption in the government. Well, I think it's true that a lot of Americans don't like the fact that there is corruption in the government, but notice that corruption is kind of almost a procedural thing, right? You have to stop corruption because corruption leads to something else. It leads to those things that harm the lives of, of working people. But the problem, I mean, the problem is in a way corruption, right? But corruption is not the thing that ends up touching our lives. And what I like so much about Bernie Sanders is that he has this really powerful vision for America as it could be. And, you know, I've just written a book called Why You Should Be a Socialist, so you can see which side I'm on. But um, one of the reasons in the book that I pitch democratic socialism is that democratic socialism really is this incredible vision of what humanity could be if we got our act together, if we used our resources well, if we had a fair economy and political system. And it looks, it starts from the point of ordinary people's lives and the problems uh, with those lives. And I find that like, there are just ways that Elizabeth Warren talks that I feel like don't indicate that she sort of has this, this real sense of like, looking out at the lives of people and, and how to make them better, right? She talks so much about her two cent wealth tax, right? But the tax isn't the point, right? Nobody cares about the tax. I mean, it's good there should be a wealth tax, right? But you don't wanna pitch a wealth tax because a wealth tax is a means to an end. What matters is what you do with the wealth tax. So, I mean, she's really strong. I mean, she's got, you know, she, the two cent wealth tax. She even has like a big inflatable dog with two cents on it, right? Because she's really pitching you on that wealth tax. But nobody's really inspired by the wealth tax because that's, the question is, what do you get for the tax? So what I like about Bernie Sanders is that he emphasizes Medicare for all, right? Not the financing mechanism itself, but, what we're going to do for you, right? And, the, and Bernie Sanders has really made Medicare for All a centerpiece of his campaign. And what is Medicare for All, right? Medicare for All is a, a single payer healthcare system where instead of having private insurance companies, we would have, we would fund healthcare through taxation as they do in other countries, right? And the government would make the payments. And the reason that's a good idea is because private insurance companies are really unnecessary. You can imagine, imagine if we funded fire services the way that we fund healthcare, where like instead of just having the government uh, 
put out the fires. Um, we had private firefighting companies and we had private insurance companies. You had to buy a private fire insurance policy from a private fire insurance company to pay for your private firefighting company. Um, it would be unnecessarily convoluted and also those private fire insurance companies would be an unnecessary step in this, right? And, and so, you know, there's a lot of scaremongering about people losing their insurance, shutting down the private insurance industry, but really it's no different from, from in that fire situation saying, look, having the insurance companies here taking a cut is, is quite unnecessary. This should be just a public service run by the government. Um, and in fact, you can see that in places where that's implemented, it has very good outcomes. Um, and so Bernie Sanders makes that pitch and he says, we're going to fund it through taxation. We're going to give Medicare for all to everyone. You're not going to have to pay premiums to a company. You're not going to have to spend time on the phone begging your company to cover you. Um, it's going to be covered. There are going to be no deductibles. These things that are nightmares in people's lives are going to go away. Um, now, <laughs> Elizabeth Warren has said, well, it's complicated, right? Because Elizabeth Warren once said that she supported single payer. Then she was asked, I think in 2012, where she supported it. And she said, no, she didn't support single payer. She said that explicitly. Um, then she said in this campaign that she supported Medicare for all, um, but has been very vague on it. It was the first she was sort of asked, um, what that would be. And she said, oh, well, there are many paths to Medicare for all. Um, and then when she, you know, has introduced a Medicare for all plan, um, she first off um, tried to bury the, the tax aspect of it, right? Because she was criticized for a while at debates and such uh, by people who said, well, you know, will it raise people's taxes? And she wouldn't give a yes or no answer to that question. Um, and I think that's a real problem, right? Because you need to be able to explain very clearly how this thing works. And taxes are part of it. Taxes are a really important part of it. And Bernie Sanders is very honest about that. If he's asked if it'll raise your taxes, he points out that the framing of the question, right, is really deliberately misleading because it treats you as an idiot. It suggests that you don't understand that a rise in your taxes that is compensated for by a diminishment in your overall healthcare costs is going to leave you much, much better off. Um, and so it's designed to make it seem like you're going to pay more when you're actually going to pay less. Uh, and people don't, they, they don't want to draw attention to the fact that you're already paying a ton for your health insurance and now you're going to be paying the government through taxation and that's, uh, that's you're, going to be, you're going to be doing well from that. And Bernie Sanders is willing to explain that, to say to people, um, yeah, but like we fund things through taxes and you get things from those taxes and those things are good and those things make you better. Um, and that's really important because Republican anti-tax rhetoric is often adopted by people in the Democratic Party and it's really dangerous because the suggestion is that taxes are a bad thing. But taxes aren't a bad thing if, if, you are actually getting something for your tax dollars. If you're getting public libraries, if you're getting fire services, if you're getting, well, let's not say police services, <laughs> but, um, uh, but if you're getting, uh, if, you, if you're getting your health, instead of having health insurance uh, paid through through a private company, you're getting uh, your, your medical care covered, right? Taxes are good. Uh, taxes are, are helping making your life better. And it's very important that we on the left uh, make that clear to people. And one problem with Elizabeth Warren being very evasive on this first and then structuring the financing of her Medicare for all plan in a way that was designed to sort of bury the tax and make it look like it wasn't a tax. I mean, one problem with that is that, as I say, she's buying, the, she's sort of repeating what the Republican criticism is, which is that, you know, oh, if it raises your taxes, oh, I don't want to say it raises your taxes, so Democrats are scared to say they'll raise your taxes. Um, but I mean, another problem is, it, it makes you look dishonest because if you're trying to bury the tax, um, then I mean, people are going to know. They're going to point it out. <laughs> it's not. It's not going to work, right? And it makes you look duplicitous. It makes you look like a person who is not being straight with the American people. And one of the things Bernie that people love about Bernie Sanders is that they feel like he's straight with the American people. And then, of course, the, the other problem with Elizabeth Warren's healthcare vision is uh, that really sort of has hurt her campaign recently. Is that 
she doesn't really seem to want to stick with it. Um, there's a New York Times article about how she's not bringing up Medicare for All uh, anymore, uh, really very much. Uh, she's kind of staying away from it because it's awkward. Um, she doesn't really want to go full on uh, single payer um, because a lot of her supporters are upper middle class and they already have good health insurance. And so for them, you know, having, you know, maybe to pay more in taxes uh, won't necessarily benefit them as much as it will benefit the working class people that uh, Bernie Sanders is trying to bring into to his coalition. Um, but it's a problem because it means that Elizabeth Warren doesn't seem that committed to something that is really, really important as part of a vision for a social democratic country. So we, and, you know, we, so we need people who are willing to be straight and willing to say, you know, this is how your health insurance should work. This is, this is, um, this is what we want for you. We want you not to have to think about money when you go to the doctor. And, and Warren also, you know, she made it kind of clear that she doesn't even really intend to fight for it. She came up with this kind of, um, uh, strategy plan that was I'm gonna at first I'm not gonna introduce Medicare for all I'm gonna introduce uh, something else a public option you know where you know, there's a new kind of thing on the market that is done by the government and you can buy that insurance um, and then <laughs> uh, so she introduced and then three years later you, she, you, you get Medicare for, she's gonna introduce Medicare for all and try to pass it then and you know observers in the uh, in finance and in the press noted that this really sent a signal that she wasn't very serious and wanted to kind of back off of, of Medicare for all because you don't uh, you don't say oh well I'm gonna do some of my agenda early on but I'm gonna put most of it off till the third year of my presidency when I'm running for re-election and wrapped up in all that stuff, it's just not gonna happen, right? And so it, we, we kind of know that she's not serious about it. Um, you, you know, Harry Reid said, oh, I work with Elizabeth Warren. She's gonna get more pragmatic when she's in office. And I think that's true. I think, I think that, that she, um, I think she has made it clear through a lot of her statements where she says like, I'm a capitalist, I, lo I love markets, um, that she doesn't really get and doesn't really share the left vision for the commons, right? Which is that there are things that we run all together for the benefit of all of us. And it's a really, really important, it's, a, it's an important part of like left principle to convey. Um, and when Elizabeth Warren is kind of evasive and doesn't say like health insurance should be something that is taken care of for you. Money should not be involved in healthcare. It shouldn't be part of this. Um, that, it, it, so for, if we get to the strategy part of it, right, it, it's very bad messaging. And her messaging is often not very good. As they say, you know, corruption, uh, wealth tax, um, these are things that don't motivate people like saying, you know, uh, your, your health is going to be taken care of. You're not going to be in debt anymore. Um, we're going to end deportations, you know, of, of uh, it, it, these are things that um, you got you to gotta focus on uh, policies that are clear and easy to convey to people. And uh, so I think if we, if we get to this, to this strategy part, um, there is a big difference between the way that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren uh, approach how to get stuff done. And Elizabeth Warren's approach is very much a regulatory one. She um, is, I mean, her best known accomplishment is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which I have written positively about, it's a good thing. Um, but also her vision of politics seems to be one that I think has gotten us in trouble in the past, which is, uh, it is, I mean, it is a, the law professor's vision of politics, which is doing good politics consists of electing good people with good plans who are smart and then letting those people execute those plans. Um, and you see that even in her slogan, which is she got a plan for that, right? She's got a plan for it, right? So you elect her, she's got the plan. So she, then she'll implement the plan. Um, but Bernie Sanders, when he talks about like how you get stuff done, how you make political change, it's not uh, just have the plans, right? And he's got plenty of plans. You can look on his website for the plans, but it's also, he calls himself, he says he's gonna be the organizer in chief. He's gonna be out in the streets building popular organizations and having those organizations elect people to every level of office and build power you know, from the bottom up. 
right? Because the idea is top-down politics was one of the things that doomed Obama. Obama dismantled uh, his, uh, what was it, Organizing for America uh, apparatus after he got elected. And that was a serious problem. It was a problem because it meant that when it came time to put a political pressure on those who were opposing him, he didn't have the people. And you've got to have organized people if you're going to get things done. So Bernie Sanders has talked about like the fact that you know when people say, "Oh, Bernie, you know no one's ever going to vote for your agenda." Well, what he's going to do is he's going to have a powerful organization of people, and those those people are going to make sure that it is beneficial to politicians to support his agenda, and that it hurts those politicians if they oppose his agenda. So what that means is that you know if if you sign on to Bernie's bill, uh, you're going to get the massive Bernie apparatus behind you, which every politician wants. And if you don't sign on to it, the massive Bernie apparatus will turn against you, and you're not going to want that. And he's talked about how, you know, if Joe Manchin of West Virginia uh, starts uh, trying to oppose him, we will find ways to convince Joe Manchin through the force of our political power um, that he needs to come around. And that's really important because Obama kind of accepted political reality as fixed. Meaning, you know, how are you going to get it through the Senate? The Senate, you've got only these senators and they won't come on board. What do you do? And I worry that Elizabeth Warren doesn't really come out of a, a labor uh, tradition. She is, a, I mean, if we're being honest, she's a very recent convert to uh, democratic politics. Um, she, until her 40s, was a Republican, uh, was kind of apolitical for many years. And I mean, the financial crisis, she became uh, quite prominent, but, and, and has sort of moved left, and moved left in particular after Bernie Sanders' uh, uh, 2016 campaign. Um, but, you know, not really evidence that she's, like, tried to build organizations. I mean, Bernie Sanders has a record here, right, of, uh, in Burlington, of mobilizing a coalition of people to get a socialist mayor elected in Burlington, which was a huge achievement, by the way, because he did it in the height of the Reagan era. And to get a socialist mayor in what was then a pretty conservative state uh, was quite an achievement. Bernie Sanders has shown that he's actually very good at organizing. His 2016 campaign came from nothing, right? Came from being a fringe candidate and nearly won that primary um, because of good organizing, because of being able to build this powerful apparatus. And you can really see that in what he's doing this time around. There's a really good article in The Intercept about Bernie's organizing operation by Ryan Grimm. And that really shows you how the Bernie team like, are very, very focused on getting people who weren't involved in politics into politics, signing them up, making sure that they're going out and making dozens and dozens of phone calls and sending texts. And they point out that the only uh, other campaign that is doing anything like the kind of organizing that uh, Bernie is doing is actually Donald Trump's campaign. And since we need to beat Donald Trump, uh, you kind of want the candidate who has that organizing apparatus. Um, and so, I think just from a purely like how, how are you going to get it done perspective, it concerns me that Elizabeth Warren has a little bit of what my uh, current affairs colleague Luke Savage has called the West Wing mentality, which is you get all the Ivy League uh, people into the West Wing of the White House and they strut down hallways having serious conversations and then they come up with the good plans. Um, they come up with better bankruptcy uh, regulations and they come up with better, you know, I, but I think, I think, but Bernie's vision is very, very different, right? It's, it's getting all of these people who have never been involved in politics before and getting them to believe in politics. And you see that he's doing that. I mean, he's got the most donors. If you look at like people like I don't know, forklift truck, truck drivers and bartenders and uh, uh, nurses, I mean, you know, Bernie is is able to appeal very, very strongly to all of those people. It's not just uh, well-educated people. It's actually I don't like the term well-educated. It's not just people who have got a lot of school. It's um, it's I mean, it's 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 everyone, right? It's a real coalition. That's it, and that's his plan to build this kind of coalition of people 
hadn't been involved before. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's very powerful. And you know, our the group Our Revolution, which sometimes it, uh, people say is a new story that's like, oh, the shadowy organization, Our Revolution, which is just like a corporate super PAC um, it, when it's actually a you know, it's kind of grassroots group that is trying to cultivate candidates and they've had mixed success, but that's what they're trying to do, right? They're trying to build something that is beyond Bernie Sanders. That is so, so critical, right? Is that it's beyond Bernie. It's not about Bernie. Um, for us, it's, it's about the things that Bernie is promising, that vision that he is offering. Um, actually, I want to go back to uh, a little bit about that, uh, that vision because I think, I think I missed <laughs> a quite important part, which is that if you want to look at you know, what is, the diff what is the real substantive difference between Bernie and Warren? It's not just that, like, he has a real, very clear social democratic aspiration and, you know, he can describe the various ways in which, you know, your life will change under a Sanders administration. And also, like, uh, if you look at her plans versus his plans, his plans are often much clearer and easier to explain. If his plan for student debt is, we're going to cancel your student debt. Um, her plan is so confusing uh, in how it works that it gives me a headache when I read it, which is for every something dollar of student debt above a certain threshold, a certain amount gets canceled. It's awful. Um, and that makes people, number one, feel stupid um, and confused. Um, and it also really dilutes the clarity of the message. Now, Bernie might not be able to cancel all student debt, but he's, what he's doing is he's making the point, right? That student debt is an injustice. It is a real serious injustice. And that student debt thing also plays into another uh, problem with some of Warren's proposals, which is that a lot of them, theirs compared to his, hers compared to his, are uh, means tested, meaning that the benefits only go to people who uh, need it. And that sounds, that sounds, well, why would you not want the benefits to only go to people who need it? Well, there's a really important point there, and you can read, we've written about this in Current Affairs, which is um, when you have universal programs that are not means tested, um, they are, they tend to be m much better. And think, so think about this. If we had, uh, this has come up a lot in the college uh, discussion, right? So uh, Pete Buttigieg says college shouldn't be free for Donald Trump's children. Well, you know, public high schools are free for Donald, Trump, Donald Trump's children. And if we started means testing public high schools or means testing fire departments, um, they would work very, very differently, right? If you had to prove your income um, in order to get those services, um, First off, a lot of people just wouldn't get them because it means introducing a layer of paperwork. Uh, it means that those who get the thing often kind of, they have to subject themselves to a humiliating bureaucracy that is determining if they're poor enough to deserve something. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, it's very difficult to measure people's income. So it introduces this giant bureaucracy. Instead, um, we want things that operate like the public library, right? Where anyone can go and get a book and they don't check your income, they don't ask you to, you know, prove, you know, give your last year's tax returns. Um, you can just go and get a book. And I think that's very, very important, and it's an important part of the kind of vision that Bernie Sanders offers, which is things that are for all, Medicare for all, right? It's something that everyone gets. Everyone should have the best quality healthcare. We should have only one kind of healthcare, which is the best, and everyone should get it because having inequalities in healthcare is very, very unfair. Now, in, in the continuing on the going back to the vision segment, um, there's a massive difference between uh, Sanders and Warren on uh, both foreign policy and environmental policy, right? And you can look, there's a Jacobin article about the differences in their climate change plans. Now, climate change is a very serious emergency, and those on the left have been pushing a Green New Deal that is a colossal plan to uh, mix, you know, a, a serious approach to tackling the actual underlying climate issues with the uh, justice, the economic justice problems that come out of climate change from the fact that some people are affected by climate change uh, much worse than other people. Um, and if you try and, and, and if you put the expense of solving climate change on ordinary working people, then they revolt as you saw um, 
for example, in France with the with the gilet jaune. So um, you know, Bernie Sanders has an has an international focus uh, on his with his climate change plan. Right, it's not just in the U.S. We have to we have to build uh, a a coalition across countries to seriously address this problem because it is a global problem. He has, and he also has a, a he understands that the fossil fuel industry is the enemy of climate action. And until you take until you vow to fight the fossil fuel fuel industry to the death, right? This is a fight to the death because the thing that they produce um, is the thing that's causing the problem. And in fact, the fossil fuel industry uh, really owes the world a lot. Right, because it has essentially been a real, an unpriced part of what they do, where they haven't paid the costs of what they do. And as a result, cities that are going to be underwater, right, the fossil fuel industry owes them reparations, right, for what was done. And in fact, the United States being that, you know, having been the worst offender on climate change, we really do owe a lot uh, to the world. But if you look at the different the, the plans that Sanders and Warren have, which you should, um, you know, this is such a colossal problem that it needs a massive ambitious plan. It needs someone who's very, very committed to it too. Um, and I think it's just very clear that, you know, Bernie could get it done and Elizabeth Warren has already scaled it back. And that's always true. And this is one of the real dangerous things is when you have someone who's compromising before the fight starts. And that's the case with a lot of Elizabeth Warren's proposals. It's certainly the case with her Medicare for All plan. Um, there's also in, in vision, there's a huge difference between them on foreign policy. I can't believe I didn't mention this before. Um, because a massive part of what the president does is not actually about the boundaries of this country. It is about how the United States interacts with the world. And here, Sanders and Warren are just miles apart. They really are. So I came of age during the Iraq war, which was a colossal foreign policy blunder. It was a real horrible, murderous atrocity that resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Iraqis. Um, it was something that was just completely indefensible, completely pointless, massive waste of American and Iraqi lives and, and of money. And, and just despicable, which is why when you see people like Michelle Obama embracing George W. Bush, uh, it really kind of tells you something about uh, their failure to appreciate exactly how bad what America did was. But anyway, Bernie Sanders was a staunch opponent of that war, and he's also given a real serious vision for a better and more humane foreign policy that understands that Americans aren't the only ones that matter in the world, right? And American foreign policy is often based on the principle that Americans are the only ones that matter in the world, that we can just treat everyone else like ants that we can crush, right? And so, you know, you saw this in the differences between their responses to uh, the recent uh, assassination of a high ranking Iranian official, which Bernie Sanders pointed out, he said, you know, he began with the anti-war perspective. He said, look, we went to war in Iraq. It was a catastrophe. We're not going to go down this road again, and I'm going to be a staunch opponent. Elizabeth Warren began by saying, yes, this man was a murderer and a terrorist and what have you, but we, you know, we need to, you know, be careful not to go to war. Well, the messaging there, the difference there couldn't be more stark. But, I mean, there's also a substantive difference, right? I mean, Bernie Sanders has, has criticized Israel in ways that um, Elizabeth Warren hasn't for things that Israel has done wrong, right? like thing in harms that they have inflicted on Palestinians that someone should stand up against. Um, Elizabeth Warren has supported Trump's sanctions on Venezuela. Those are uh, crippling sanctions that are harming the people of Venezuela. Um, you know, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, the economist, has pointed out that Venezuelans, uh, that, you know, their lives are being made significantly worse by U.S. sanctions. And the Wall Street Journal uh, praised Elizabeth Warren for her support of sanctions. Um, so I think... Uh, <laughs> And, and, and you look at every one of their statements, right? Elizabeth Warren was saying that you know, in 2011 that we should have no options off the table with regard to Iran. Well, no options off the table means, you know, w war, <laughs> right? That's, that's not, you can't trust a person who thinks that, you know, an, an aggressive war is on the table even, right? You have to have someone who really seriously is committed to reining in American militarism. And, uh, you know, when Elizabeth Warren asked questions about this, you know, she was asked, should more um, Americans serve in the U.S. military? She said, oh, yes, yes. Well, um, 
<laughs> Excuse me, the correct answer to that question is no, we want a smaller military, right? We need to we need to rein in our military activity because it's costing so much money and is not making us safer. Um, it's I mean, every time she ta she talks about uh, uh, you know, foreign policy, you know, the same was true with Bolivia. Um, it's just yeah, every you can. I mean, I could come up with dozens of statements that she's made on these issues that just don't inspire confidence that she really gets it. I mean, she's voted for Trump's military budgets, which Bernie hasn't, um, and you you can't do that. <laughs> um, okay, so just uh, yeah, get, now let's get let's get to this this character point because I think this is really important. Um, this is important for strategic reasons, and it's also important for. Uh, the reason of wanting a person who is actually going to do good things. So in, ter in terms of running against Trump, you want someone who people are going to like more than they like Trump. Um, but you also need a person you can trust. And I think Bernie Sanders, like, if you look at the way people think about him, people really do trust that he is who he says he is. He's a real honest and straightforward guy who's been saying the same thing since he was 18 years old and he was getting dragged away in handcuffs from civil rights protests. Um, and that's powerful. It's powerful to have someone who, you, know, you look, go look up all the clips of Bernie Sanders in the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and every point, like, the, the great moral issue of the time, he's there taking the right stand on it. If you want to get tough on crime, let's deal with the causes of crime. Let's demand that every man, woman, and child in this country have a decent opportunity and a decent standard of living. Let's not keep putting poor people into jail and disproportionately punishing blacks. And someone's record is so important because their record indicates it's all you have to know what a politician's going to be like. Because you can't trust any politician, not even Bernie Sanders. You shouldn't trust Bernie Sanders. Um, but you have to sort of look at what they've done. Now, the fact that Elizabeth Warren was a Republican for so long and didn't seem to notice that the party of Reagan was horribly racist, it's forgivable. People change, people evolve, people grow. Um, <laughs> but... It's also the case that Elizabeth Warren's record doesn't uh, of, doesn't really inspire confidence. As I've said, you know, her politics still aren't amazing. They're also very recent, right? She wasn't out there supporting key parts of the of the Sanders agenda until they became very popular. So she hasn't been a leader on much. Um, you know, as I said, we don't want to diminish her accomplishments um, with the with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, but that's what people people always point to that, right? They always point to that to that one thing, um, and you know, in terms of character, I think consistency is important. Um, and yes, you know, she's evolved and grown, but she's also not always completely honest, and that's bad, right? It's not just that when she's asked about tax rises. She uh, was evasive. It's also that there are kind of hypocrisies. Um, so at a recent debate, uh, she pointed out, you know, that Pete Buttigieg had this fundraiser in a wine cave with a bunch of rich people. And Pete Buttigieg came back and said, uh, yeah, but what about you? You carried over, you were fine raising money from rich people until this campaign. And, you know, uh, and she's had f fundraisers in these kinds of places, and she carried over money from her Senate campaign that she raised um, without the kind of restrictions that she now thinks cause corruption. So he said, well, you know, were you corrupt back then or, you know, or, or not? And she didn't really have a response to that. I do not sell access to my time. I don't do call time Hold with millionaires second. and billionaires. Sorry, as of I when, don't Senator? Meet, I don't meet behind closed doors. Senator, your presidential campaign right now, as we speak, is funded in part by money you transferred, having raised it at those exact same big ticket fundraisers you now denounce. Did it corrupt you? Now, notably, when Bernie Sanders went after Pete Buttigieg on um, the, this kind of fundraising, uh, making fun of him for having so many billionaire donors, um, Pete Buttigieg did not strike back. And one reason for that is that Bernie Sanders is consistent and principled. Now, there's a real competition going on up here. My good friend Joe, and he is a good friend, <laughs> he's received contributions from 44 billionaires. Pete, on the other hand, is trailing, Pete. 
You only got 39 billionaires contributing. Um, and it's true that Elizabeth Warren has done the things that she says that she doesn't want to be done, right? <laughs> she, she has, she's had closed door meetings with, with bankers, right? She's, she's taken the money of, of billionaires. Um, she, she's, she even, like, she criticizes the revolving door in Washington of people who uh, go into the corporate sector afterwards and come out from the corporate sector. I mean, she put people from Capital One in the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. That's, I mean, and who went out back into the banking sector. I mean, she was part of that, facilitated. She, you know, held open the revolving door. Um, so you need someone who actually lives their values. Um, you know, and, and, and she has a tendency to be kind of dishonest, right? There was a parent who asked her, uh, if her who said, uh, well, you know, you, you're an advocate of, of public schools, but you put your kids in private schools. And she said, my children went to public schools. Well, that's, tr so, I mean, her children did at some points go to public schools, but her son went to private school for a very long time. And, you know, you gotta be honest. You gotta say, okay, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I put my son in a private school because, because our public schools aren't very good and I wanna fix our public schools, right? That's what you say. You don't mislead someone because we can, we, we know, we can point it out. These things are public record. Um, you know, I think the Native American issue, you know, no one wants to talk about it. Everyone's like, leave the Native stuff alone. Everyone, everyone thinks they're a Cherokee when they're young and then they find out. Okay, but also, this Native thing was bad during this campaign, right? Remember that she kicked off this campaign but with, by waving the DNA test around that seemingly was doubling down on the claim that she was a Native American, right? Why take a DNA test unless you're trying to prove that you are indeed a Native American? But she's not a Native American. She used to put it on government forms. She said her race was American Indian. Um, Harvard Law School used to brag about its diversity because it had Native American, Elizabeth Warren, right? <laughs> and. And she kind of you know, seemed to still believe it during this campaign. I mean, she, I guess it's not the worst thing that she like, you know, contributed to a Native American cookbook saying she was a Cherokee. You know, it, it's sort of forgivable. It's very weird uh, to me. <laughs> um, but the worst thing was that she then, you know, in this campaign started off with with this native stuff and and and, and seemingly like now wants to pretend that part of her campaign didn't happen, like scrubbed it from social media because it was really embarrassing and she was made fun of for it. It also suggests that she's not ready to take on Trump, right? Because Trump's going to bring this stuff up. You know, he's going to bring up the up the stuff that she fabricated her ethnic identity for many years. Um I mean, I say fabricated because, like, yeah, we might all believe that we have a Cherokee ancestor, but we don't all, like, lift a recipe from the New York Times and pretend it's an Indian recipe. I mean, that's kind of dishonest. That's not good. Um, there are these little deceptions. Like, take Elizabeth Warren's work as a corporate lawyer. She's a professor at Harvard Law School. She took on corporate clients on the side. Um, and personally, I don't think this is the kind of work people should do, right? I really don't. Um, because it's, uh, it's, it's stuff that, I mean, she ended up uh, defending chemical companies and, you know, she, that, was, oh, that was like the, well, it's defending some company against claims by retired coal miners who wanted their health care, right? When you work for corporate clients, you're a mercenary. You're doing amoral things. And okay, we might say, she might say, oh, well, look, I didn't have any principles back then. No, no, no. She'd just say like, this was a side gig, come on. And we can forgive her, even though, as I say, like, if you're a decent human being, right, and, and you think that you're so worthy that you should be the president, you really should have a record of spending your life fighting for people. If you just got around to it in the last decade of your life, even though you've been here for many, 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 many years, and you weren't standing up on the big moral issues of your day, um, yeah, I could forgive you, but I, I don't really want you to be the presidential nominee if we have someone who did do that. But anyway, okay, yeah, so, she worked for these corporate clients, but, but, I think the point is um, that she has kind of misled about these things. And that's not just my characterization. If you read the Washington Post and the New York Times reports on this, they really do not paint a good picture of the way that she's choosing to represent that legal work, which is not, I was a mercenary, but I was on the side of consumers. Well, she wasn't on the side of consumers all the time. She was some of the time, um, but these are reporters who are not antagonistic to Warren. Um, 
And yet, they concluded that this that she, her campaign's spin on this is not true, right? She wasn't working on behalf of consumers. She was working on behalf of the people that the consumers were suing. Now, she can say, I was doing that because I wanted better bankruptcy laws, which she did and, and does. Um, but it's not going to be... Uh, people are going to know that you're deceiving them. So don't... don't don't do it. <laughs> I don't know how to say this, right? You've got to be honest. And and I think there is this problem with Elizabeth Warren where if you watch clips of her, she's often doesn't answer the question, right? She often uh, you know seems to just fudge things a little bit, like you know, like her corporate work, like this native thing. And I th people are gonna know that. You you have to have we really need someone. We've run candidates that didn't seem authentic. You know, John Kerry, <laughs> Al Gore, Hillary Clinton, those types of people. We really need someone who is blunt, who is honest, who doesn't sugarcoat stuff, who doesn't massage the truth, right? <laughs> who, and who has a long history of showing that the things that they say they're going to do are the things that they really believe in and are going to do. I think Bernie Sanders just is head and shoulders. I think he's so far above Elizabeth Warren on this count. And I think it's so important to emphasize that, not just because I like Bernie more. I mean, I, by the way, it's important to criticize Bernie. We shouldn't be Bernie fanatics, right? We should, it's, it's important that we not be cultists because we only like Bernie because we think he's better on these things. And if he ceases to be better, we need to criticize him on that. Right? But I really do think that it's not just even that he's better on, on these things, it's also that we need to defeat Donald Trump. And Elizabeth Warren has glaring weaknesses in Donald Trump, glaring things in her, in her record that he can, that he can exploit. Um, she's not really going to be able to run on him, even on her signature issue of like corruption, because she hasn't been perfect on, on campaign finance and there are real things to really criticize her about. And when Pete Buttigieg went after her on it, she didn't really have a good response. So is she gonna have a good response to Donald Trump? Donald Trump is a way better campaigner than people realize, right? He's built a formidable organizing operation. He's got so much goddamn money right now. He's out raising all of the Democrats. Not put together, but he's out raising them all, right? It's gonna be a tough general election no matter who we run. And so we've gotta have someone who has as many strengths as possible. Now, look at Bernie's operation. Look at this organizing apparatus he's built. Right? Look at, you know, yeah, people make fun of us Bernie supporters, you know, as being like uh, cultists or whatever. But, have to say, it's gonna help in a general election to have this giant team of people who love him and would, do, would die for him and are gonna work night and day to get him elected, right? That's what you need. You need people with that level of enthusiasm. It's so good, and the, and the, you know, that's not just a tiny minority of people. Bernie Sanders' uh, favorability ratings are very, very good. Um, he's well-liked, he's well-trusted, people say he's the best on a bunch of issues. So we can make a really good pitch for him. Um, I don't, I'm not certain that he's gonna win, but I just think, you know, if you're gonna, you, why squander that massive apparatus he's built since 2016? Um, on, I mean, Elizabeth Warren doesn't have that kind of thing. She doesn't have that kind, that quite that kind of enthusiasm. She doesn't have the fundraising capabilities. She's already proven that. She's lagging in fundraising. Um, you know, it's gonna be, you, we would be missing out on an opportunity to take advantage of the fact that we have a candidate who is, <sighs> well positioned to take on Trump, right? Because he doesn't have the vulnerabilities that Hillary Clinton had. He doesn't have, you know, friends on Wall Street, billionaire donors, all these things where, you know, Trump was able to point at Hillary Clinton and say, you do the things that you accuse me of doing, right? You know, Goldman Sachs, you know, uh, you know, you say I'm warlike, but you voted for the Iraq war. Um, and you need someone who doesn't have that kind of vulnerability. Like, I mean, Joe Biden's terrible for this because Joe Biden's corrupt and voted for the war um, and then lied about his support of the war. Um, so you need someone who doesn't have that vulnerability. And Bernie Sanders is the closest thing we've got. So his policies are the best, especially on foreign policy, which should be half of what you, of, of what the president does. And, and they're like, you know, he is the anti-war candidate. And, you know, as I, as I mentioned, I grew up during the Iraq war where like the war was the big issue for the left. And 
That should be a huge part of what we care about, is making sure that we live in a peaceful and just world. And, you know, if, if you care about that at all, Bernie Sanders is the only candidate. You know, if you care about climate change at all, Bernie Sanders is the only candidate, right? You need someone who is hyper ambitious on climate change. You need the person who, and you know, the Sunrise Movement just endorsed Bernie Sanders and they rated the various climate plans. Bernie was the only one who got the top rating. And, uh, and look, nothing we can actually do on climate change is gonna be ambitious enough. Right? So you need the most ambitious candidate. So even if you're not a leftist, even if you're just someone who is a centrist but recognizes the scientific reality of climate change, you need to be on the Bernie train, right? Because he's the only one who's got the, who's gonna build the kind of powerful political movement that is actually gonna cram this through. And then, yeah, maybe Elizabeth Warren can, but imagine it, right? Are we really gonna, is that really gonna happen, right? She's really gonna be so powerful that she can galvanize people the way Bernie galvanizes people. She's gonna get the same attendance at her events that he would have gotten, right? People are wild for Bernie. People are gonna go organize for Bernie. People are gonna send thousands of texts for Bernie, right? He is the person we need right now. So progressives, get behind him. Right, this is an amazing opportunity to have a strong candidate against Donald Trump, a candidate who's always been against the millionaires and the billionaires. By the way, Elizabeth Warren was asked if billionaires should exist and she said yes, which is the wrong answer. The existence of billionaires means feudalism, right? Billionaires have like so much more power than everyone else and Bernie Sanders said no, of course not, right? That's, so when people say, well, what's the difference between Elizabeth Warren's capitalism and Bernie Sanders' socialism? One reason is that socialists think that giant class divisions shouldn't exist. They don't just believe in regulating markets a little more, they believe in dismantling massive inequalities where some people have a lot more power than others. And, you know, Warren will say she believes in redistributing power a bit, but it, I mean, clearly not because, you know, that, that question about billionaires is pretty blunt. It's a which side are you on question. And if you, if you answer that wrong, then you're on the wrong side. And I think, you know, we, we should all, and so, you know, but Bernie Sanders has this really, really clear message against Donald Trump, who's a cartoon of an evil billionaire. He's the perfect person for Bernie to run against because he really embodies all of the stuff that Bernie Sanders says is wrong with politics. And Bernie doesn't have the kind of vulnerability to the attacks that Donald Trump will make that any of the other Democratic candidates will make. Now, I haven't addressed, like, I've done a video about Joe Biden. Pete Buttigieg is just, you know, clearly awful, right? I've done a whole long article about him. I don't think there's any chance that he's going to win, though. Um, so, really, reasonable people should be deciding between Bernie and Warren, and I respect people who are considering Warren, but... I would say, think about it. Think about whether her presidency has the transformative capacity that a Bernie Sanders presidency has, whether it has the kind of vision, the kind of powerful animating vision, whether it has the kind of organizing strategy that's gonna get people out, uh, you know, and whether she has the kind, whether you really trust her the way you trust, trust Bernie. I mean, watch her statements, watch the way she talks. I just don't feel as if um, you know, she has this quite the same kind of commitment, right? I mean, she spent most of her life at an elite law school training, you know, people to go to work for Wall Street firms. Um, and that is a choice that you make with your life. Uh, you choose what to do. And you know, Bernie Sanders, from a young age, from a very young age, uh, chose to live a life of fighting the powerful on behalf of the powerless. And that moves me. That means that I'm willing to place a kind of trust in him that I wouldn't place in almost any other politician. Um, and he's earned that trust through a lifetime of work. You know, Bernie Sanders is old and he's, <laughs> it's not optimal to nominate a candidate who is that old, but one reason that he's such a good candidate is because he has that long of a record. And I, I really do feel like, you know, we can give him our support in a way, we can give more of ourselves to him than we would to almost any other politician because so many of them will let you down and he hasn't let us down. And, you know, I get, I was so positive about Warren early in the campaign. I ran a, a, an article about her excellent ideas. You know, I, I was, I was, I was, I was open-minded. I really tried to be. 
Um, and I thought that, you know, one of them should win and it didn't matter which one. But, you know, she's just disappointed me over and over and over. And I know she's probably disappointed you too. You know, you, her statements, you go, yeah, that's kind of right, but not complete. So, you know, that, that deflation, that sense of deflation you feel, that should, that should really be a giant red flag. And, uh, and we should listen to, uh, you know, listen to reason, but we should also listen to our hearts. And we need a candidate who doesn't disappoint us all the time because we need, it's gonna be a hard fight against Donald Trump. It really, really is. And so I think we need Bernie and we need him now. Um, and I would encourage you to support Bernie Sanders, download the Burn app on, on, your, on your phone and, uh, you know, and, and, and get out there and let's, let's make this happen and we take the country back from this horrible, horrible monster. Um, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to have a, a, a political candidate and have a president we can at least sort of believe in. We shouldn't, you know, don't believe too much in anyone, but uh, this is something of unique promise. It's a very special moment. And I just, I, like, I don't think Elizabeth Warren has the same thing. And I think we need to recognize that very soon. Uh, because otherwise, we could end up with a Joe Biden candidacy because progressives are split and everyone's talking about unity and nobody's willing to make the crucial distinctions and say and tell the truth. So, you know, look at their records, look at everything, and then I, I think you'll have to conclude that it really is a Bernie Sanders candidacy. That is our best shot, and you've got to come over it now. Good progressives, good Warren supporters, I would invite you... Please don't miss this, uh, this, this powerful moment uh, for our country and uh, support Bernie Sanders. So thank you very much. And I think everyone, oh, the other thing you should do is subscribe to Current Affairs Magazine, which is a very good magazine, uh, actually. And I run that magazine.